Kate loved boots. If you had boots, you could do anything. I needed some boot power today, so I brought them, and I'm just going to tuck them under here. Um, my name is Lisa Millet Rao, and Kate was my aunt. First, I want to start out by thanking the veteran feminists of America for, for putting this on. It seems like it was just yesterday, but it was really two decades ago, in 1998, when they honored Kate. And I brought all my college roommates, and the room was filled. But Kate's missing today. Yoko mentioned, um, I think we've got a budding theme here, and it's Kate's smile. The, the program is exquisite. Um, you know, Kate not only had an exquisite smile, it was unconventional, like Kate. It kind of leaned left. <laughs> and most of the people in this room who know Kate know that when she would look at you with that twinkle in her eye and the left-leaning smile, you were about to go on an adventure. Or she knew that you knew that what somebody was saying wasn't right, but she communicated volumes with that smile. I want to introduce the family that came here on behalf of Kate today. Her older sister, Sally Millett, who's the one person in this room that's known her forever. <laughs> Sophie Keir, who was introduced earlier. Um, <laughs> Peggy Millett, who was the half-sister Kate met later in life. <laughs> um, her niece, Victoria Rao. Um, two nephews, Kayla Brow and Nathan Krasner. Her, her nephew-in-law, as she called him, Larry Krasner, who just finished a race for district attorney of Philadelphia. Um, and then there were a number of people who wanted to be here today. Stephen Rao and Christine Muirs had tickets here, and health kept them away, but I hear they're watching online. Kate Rao also bought her ticket, Kate's namesake, and um, is watching online as well. David Rao and um, Christine, Kristen Vigard, um, and then a ream of grand nieces and nephews. Our Aunt Kate, she insisted it was aunt, not a little bug aunt. I want to tell you what, from the family's perspective about Aunt Kate. We knew her as an artist first. She would come for visits, and she would open her suitcase and pull out her art supplies and get down on the floor cross-legged with us, equal because we were equal, and then we did art together. And even her art was unconventional. She didn't do pumpkins by carving and gashing them. It was much more pacifistic and nonviolent to paint them. And many people who have been to the farm have seen her pumpkins that were just exquisite. She also talked to us like we were adults. You know, in the 50s and 60s, adults didn't get cross-legged on the floor and talk to you like that. So even in terms of child psychology, she was ahead of her time. And her sculptures. As little kids, we were in love with her sculptures. Kate would take tables, and she'd add arms to them. She would take stools and add feet to them. She brought them alive. They should have freedom, too. They should be able to move, too. Freedom, liberation, even if you were a, an object, you could move if you want. My very favorite sculpture of Kate's was this piano stool. She put two legs on it and a good pair of sturdy boots. 
It was almost as if she was saying, you know, if you ever get sick of people sitting on you, you can run away. You can hide. You've got freedom, liberation. If you were a thing or a person, liberation and freedom is what Kate believed in. We later learned that Kate was an artist of words, too. And for all of the people in this room, I'm sure everybody here has read her work, it was almost as if she thought the words were her friends, and she sat down on the floor cross-legged and played with them. She was unconventional in how she wrote as well, big surprise. She challenged notions of grammar. Sometimes you needed a run-on sentence to express something. Sometimes a sentence should be just one word. And she was also non-hierarchical in how she saw words. There was no hierarchy. You could take a big, complex word, and it was really beautiful if you mixed it with a pithy short one. They should all get along, be integrated. Gave you better meaning, and things were more beautiful that way, at least from Kate's perspective. She wasn't just an artist of words, though. Kate was a true scholar of words. She went to the University of Minnesota and graduated magna cum laude. And you know, her junior and senior year, my mother Sally told me that she couldn't afford her dues. She wasn't so great with budget, as Yoko mentioned, and didn't have the money to pay the dues. Where her cue was so high, they said, it doesn't matter. You don't need to pay the dues. You can bring up the collective cue of the sorority. And so that was cool. She was studying words at, at University of Minnesota and then went on to Oxford and became the first American woman to graduate with honors from St. Hilda's College, studying words again. Then she came back to Columbia, again, to study words and literature, comparative literature, and again, graduated with distinction. Now, it was at Columbia, you know, when you get to the point where you have to write your dissertation, they drill it into your head. It's got to be something someone has never said before. It's got to be unique. It's got to contribute to the world in a way that's useful. Well, we already know all of these schools thought she was a brilliant student. So she sat down to do her homework, and sexual politics was born. Kate Millett looked at words. She knew how powerful they were. She understood that with words, you could oppress. You could take beautiful language and convince women that what was supposed to be written as romance was really oppression. But if you read the words, they look beautiful. So if we are in love, shouldn't we be objects? Shouldn't we go along? And Kate, like the beautiful artist she is, revealed the invisible ink below. And it was, she used her power with words, just like she added freedom to her sculptures with arms and legs. She took words and freed women in writing sexual politics. It's interesting that the same year that Kate um, finished sexual politics, her sister Sally decided, you know what, I may be in my 40s, but I'm going to law school. And as sexual politics came out, Kate was in demand to speak all the time, and so she was always busy, and so sometimes in Nebraska they'd say, Sally Millett, you come out and, and speak as well. So the two sisters, the two Millett sisters, were kind of running around trying to change the world and bring women's rights all around. In 1970, all the nieces and nephews were between the ages of 6 and 13. In August of 1970, 
Kate Millett was on the cover of Time magazine. We thought that was so cool. I mean, she was just doing her homework and she got on the cover of Time magazine. She wasn't trying to start a revolution. She was doing her homework. We thought that was very cool, but our mother told us that Kate was upset. She didn't want to be on the cover of Time magazine. It was a movement. It wasn't about Kate Millett. She kept saying over and over again, it's thousands of women. It's human rights. It's women's rights. It's not Kate Millett. But they didn't listen. She didn't pose for that picture on the cover. Because if she had posed, she would have that beautiful, exquisite smile. She wouldn't look so stern and angry. They put her on the cover of Time, and we thought it was great. We were so proud of her. Even if she didn't think she should be there, we still thought she was cool. And four short months later, we realized the wisdom of what Kate was saying. Time magazine wrote another article. This time, it was Women's Lib, a second look. You could tell by the title that something was going to be not so good about it. Friends started to whisper. Teachers started to whisper. What's bisexual, we asked our mother. She said it's when you might fall in love with a man or you might fall in love with a woman. What does that have to do with her cool book? I mean, we're not supposed to be in the room when people are doing that thing that we still weren't so clear about anyway. It's none of our business who somebody's sleeping with. And we knew our Aunt Kate. She was cool. She was fun. And they shouldn't pick on her. And people from all different angles started challenging her. Some people told her, pretend you're not bisexual. Keep it quiet. You're going to ruin the movement. Outside the movement, they attacked her. She must hate men. And they tried to undermine the movement by attacking Kate, which was precisely her point from the beginning. They were mean. They were really mean. But Kate knew that when it involves human rights, you just stand up and you have courage. She was so brave. But it was then that she learned that all mail was not necessarily a birthday card with money in it. So many of us know that that's when she stopped reading her mail. If you wanted to talk to Kate or tell her something, you had to call her. You didn't want to write her. But she did something so wonderful with the, the money that she got from sexual politics, she thought she was rich. So she went out and bought a farm, the farm. It was her sanctuary. It was where she would invite everyone who she loved to come whenever they wanted. They didn't even have to call in advance. Just show up. I'll always be here. You knew certain months Kate was going to be at the farm and you could go there. And the place was magical. I went to school out east, so um, I was often there because it, I didn't have the money to go home. And there began my visits to the farm for the last four decades. But this is what Kate did at the farm. This shows how much fun she is. She named everything on the farm. Everything had a name. There was the Lavender Barn. There was Sophie's Chicken Coop. There was the Simone de Beauvoir Room. There was the Marilyn Monroe Room. Even closets had names. The Fibber McGee Closet. She would get that twinkle in her eye. And every room was decked out with art and oriental carpets that she had found at some estate sale or another. One visit we were up there and Kate said, I was thinking of starting an art colony. I've been doing some studying 
And if you grow Christmas trees, it takes half as much time. I mean, you can do it as a part-time job. So we could have women come and work half the day, do their art the other half of the day, and the third half of the day, you would have dinner. And dinner was butter, lettuce, candles, food, Cote de Rhone, and long, long conversations. How many people in this room have been to one of Kate's farm meals? Fabulous journeys. Her farm family is here en masse. She would be so happy. But just because Kate found a refuge at the farm doesn't mean that she withdrew from the world. Sally, her sister, tells this story of Kate, during World War II, when she was 10 years old, would cry and cry and cry about all the people who were killed from the bombings. And Kate lived her life that way. If there was a bully, Kate would go after the bully. She was never afraid of bullies. The bully might be government misusing its power. It might be somebody torturing a woman in a basement. It might be somebody making fun of somebody for who they loved. But Kate went after bullies, and she showed us all how to do it. I remember in 1979, Iran, There had been a revolution, and the Ayatollah Khomeini took over. And within just so fast, he stripped away the rights that women had been gaining over the last several decades. And feminists from all around the world said, we're going to go to Iran and stand by our sisters. But then the government Many people from the government called and said, we can't assure your safety. If you go to Iran, it's on you. We can't protect you. Kate was undaunted. She and Sophie went off to Iran. My mother was worried sick. She called me one night. I was in Philadelphia. It was the opening night of her niece, Kristen Vigard's um, show. And my mother called and said, I've heard Kate has been arrested in Iran, so watch the news and see if you can see something. So we turned on the TV, and there was Kate being hauled off by police. And I couldn't see Sophie, and, and I didn't know if she was there. And, and this was pre-internet, pre-cell phone, so you couldn't Google it, you couldn't see. We had lived in Afghanistan a decade earlier, and in Afghanistan, if you didn't have family to feed you when you were in prison, then you might starve. So should one of us go over there? How would Kate eat? Was Sophie free and not Kate? We didn't know. And finally, we were so elated when our mother called and said that she landed safely in Paris, her favorite city. There were so many adventures, but I want to leave room for the others who have adventures to tell. But one thing that is so exciting is that at least during Kate's lifetime, she got to see the world change in large part, in large part because of the movement, because of the second wave movement, many of the people in this room who were fundamental parts of it. I remember how proud she was when the UN adopted the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. It was the first human rights treaty of the 21st century. She was so proud of it. She was so proud of the Yoko Ono Award for Courage in the Arts. And then in 2013, her um, nieces and nephews and Sally and Sophie and I went up to Seneca Falls when she was inducted into the 
National Women's Hall of Fame. It was during the famous government shutdown and Nancy Pelosi was up there as well and we couldn't do it in a government building so they shoved us all in a hotel and for Kate that was better because it was more of a party. In 2014, I sent Kate an email because um, in Pennsylvania, same-gender marriages were finally legal, and I was going to have the opportunity as a judge to officiate one of the first ones, so I was uh, so excited and sent Kate an email, and she responded in like five minutes and said, you must send pictures. Can you imagine she got to see that after being bullied just because she loved women? And she got to see that the government finally came around. I'm so happy she did. You know, uh, Gloria Steinem, our next speaker, had said at one point, the world was asleep and Kate woke them up. But she didn't wake them up to start a fight or start a revolution. She was just trying to speak the truth and fight big bullies. So anyway, if, if we want to honor Kate, and I think everyone here is to honor Kate, what we should do is grab a pair of boots, put them on, Pick an injustice, any injustice. She didn't pick favorites just because they affected her lives. Any human right was something you fought for. And then imagine that gorgeous, exquisite smile of hers and the twinkle she would have had in her eyes. And go out there and fight with courage. But you know, not just courage. Make sure it's an adventure. On behalf of Kate's family, you're all her family, um, I want to thank you for being here today.